Thank you very much. And uh, as um, Ed mentioned, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here. Let me start by saying that um, the future, and that's where I want to focus, the future of Manitoba's agriculture sector is really shaped by you. It's, it's shaped by me. But I think it's important to recognize the role that everyone in our society plays. And in this conversation, I'd like to talk a little bit about, following from Ed, I'd like to talk a little bit about our comfort level with agriculture. And I'd like to talk about the concept of adaptation and what it takes to, to have successful adaptation. The adaptation, successful adaptation, is really related to uh, uh, a feature that is common in a population, in a society, and that is providing some improved function. So when you think about common in a population, common in a population of Manitobans, and some improved function, some improved quality of life, that is the goal that we're striving. And so when I talk about, ooh, I don't even have my slide up, and forgot to say forward. <laughs> so when I talk about Manitoba Agriculture 2050, I've picked 2050 because I want to take us forward in this conversation. Why? The young people that are on our farms today, the young people that are in the industry today, whether it's food processing, whether it's the input and supply industry, those young people are going to be gearing, their, their career goals end by 2050. Their role as leaders will be between now and 2050. And their decisions are going to be very important in terms of where amount of agriculture is going to be in 2050. It's within our conceptual grasp because it is us, particularly our young people. We know a lot about what the world will be like in 2050. We understand the dynamics around global population change and global food demand. We understand climate change. It's not a mystery anymore. We know what to expect. We also are shifting from a mindset of mitigation, trying to reduce water use, trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, trying to uh, reduce resource use, to one of adaptation. We know that there are limits there. Uh, we are not going to stop mitigation, but we have to, as a society and as an industry, start thinking about the fact that change will come. It will come faster than it ever has. And we need to be a little bit more proactive in our thinking and planning to, to deal with adaptation. The last thing is maybe more um, something that a dean of agriculture should think about because we are training many of these people. We need to think about the role of the professionals that are going into the industry and are joining the public sector. The role of dietitians and nutritionists, the role of the engineers we train, the role of the food technologists and, and the agrologists that help the people that are producing the food. And sometimes who are the people producing the food. As I've mentioned, we are in a time of change. That change is going to be coming more quickly than ever before. And it's going to be coming from many, many areas. We know some of those. Um, we, we might not know the weather in a week from now, but we have a sense of what it's going to be, and we can predict much better than ever before. There are areas in which we have less, much less clarity, and for those reasons, uh, we have to be able to uh, think a little bit more proactively about adaptation. We do not know global politics. We do not know the next steps that we will be exposed to with respect to new technologies and new opportunities. We do not know um, how uh, insurance companies, how transportation agencies are going to use the knowledge that they have and how that's going to affect our industries. There are many things that we know less about than we know about the things that have been in the media quite a bit, global population, food security, and uh, climate change. I'm going to just pass through this because uh, really all I wanted to say with this is that this is an example of something that um, has been thrown out as a challenge to all of us, but something that for prairie agriculture we have a, a good understanding of. 
Um, we understand that we'll be dealing with uh, variability. We understand that our opportunities to grow crops is going to expand because we have fewer, uh, less heat restriction. We understand uh, the water cycle is going to change. We understand we have opportunities in Manitoba for agriculture. We also understand that globally, the challenges are going to be much greater than the challenges that we are likely to face here. So we have a role to play in terms of global food security. I want to just very briefly touch upon the nature of change because I think that um, how we define that is different um, uh, from person to person. I think there's a recognition that things change. Crop yields go up percent and a half or so a year due to improved genetics, improved field management practices. And these are referred to as incremental changes. And we can see them at many levels. I've just given you there some examples of what it might look like in terms of biological efficiency. Um, the te drone technology we've heard a lot about in recent uh, months is an example of a technology advancement that might become an, uh, important in food production and will change how we do things. And there are many, many social examples as well. And one example might be just water use restrictions. But there's also something that is a big shift change, something that can really be a game changer. And, and we've had that in the past. When we discovered we could harness nitrogen from the air and turn that into nitrogen fertilizer, we, that was a game changer for agriculture. That was a game changer for the consumers of, of food because they suddenly had much cheaper um, uh, sources of food than had we never been able to uh, come up with the Habibah um, uh, technology. At the University of Manitoba and other places in the world, we're doing some of the kind of work that is going to have the potential for game changing. We're working with crops, grains like like uh, wheat and oil seeds like sunflowers and looking to the opportunity of turning those into perennial crops so that we don't have to till fields and seed annually but harvest from the same plant year after year after year. If that technology can become competitive, that is a huge game changer. Not just from the perspective of agriculture but a number of perspectives. Technologies. We, we spend a great deal of time talking about the merits of animal use for meat production, uh, about how we feed our animals, about what we expect in terms of safe meat. Um, and on the side, in the faculties of medicine that are trying to graft new skin and grow new livers and, and develop new pancreatic cells for insulin uh, users, we have now got the technology that allows us to produce, I'll call it fake meat, in vitro meat, that could be a part of a hamburger. And that is about a third le generation level technology that is based on advances in tissue culture, advances in extrusion, and it's just a matter of time, and a matter of time in, in just years, where we will have those kinds of fake meats that are, that are good enough to come into our processed foods and you won't know what you're eating. Well, I mean, there'll be a label. <laughs> but, you won't be able to tell the difference, especially if processed foods is what you grew up with and, and more and more of our youth do. That kind of a technology can be a, a game changer without us knowing that it's coming. Socially, California is going from a three-year drought to saying that there may be no water rights next year because they'll be out of water. A game changer. And so that is the kind of future we should be expecting. It's not all negative, it's opportunity as well. But these are big changers. Which leads me to that conversation about are we ready for adaptation? Do we understand where we're going? And one of the things that we really need to think about is what adaptation is. There are too many people who see this as nothing more than conserving what once was. If all we want is our past, we're not adapting. It's really about striving to manage our resources, our land, so that all the benefits that we gain can be sustained, despite inevitable change. We can't stop change. And there are many metrics around adaptation that we are not talking about enough today that would connect the consumer with the producer, that would connect um, the, the um, 
advocate groups that would uh, with with the with the lobbyists with the politicians and that is around how we develop the metrics and and there are a few key things that I'd like to, to mention I think we need to start thinking about how we speak in terms of adaptation in our future in comprehensive terms we have to stop separating agriculture from all of the other functions that we use our resources for recreation um, and all the other functions we have to we, we have to we have to look at how we can unify this. There are synergies with some of the things that we do. Every time we have a biological efficiency, it means that we're producing more food with less resource use. Are there other unifying themes that we could be identifying? And are we willing to be honest in terms of trade-off conversations? Because there will be trade-offs in the future. And without a clear conversation, those trade-offs are unlikely to happen with a level of comfort that is required for, for the various parts of our society to trust each other. When we think of metrics, we have to think of how we communicate. They have to be simple enough that everyone understands. And they have to be transparent. It's not just about setting the tone. It's about showing whether we're making progress or not. And there will be times when a great idea, a great policy, is not going to set the, take us to the, to the goal we're striving for and we need to be um, strong enough and ethical enough as leaders to, to then share that with, with the public. We have to recognize that our policies and our ideas are not globally applicable. Land is managed farm by farm, field by field. When an adverse event happens, it happens in a location. A flood is not across Canada. A drought is not across Manitoba. We have to be able to think liberally enough, flexibly enough, that we recognize this importance of thinking locally and allowing people to react and, and proactively deal with things on a local level. The last thing about adaptation and trying to find some metrics for it is that it is in time. When we are proactive, we are adapting in time. When we are reacting, we're reacting in time. And so whether the measure is correct for tomorrow doesn't matter. The fact that we've tried to set it today and are willing to take a look at what we've accomplished with those efforts tomorrow and modify them, that is successful adaptation and that is successful use of metrics. Oh dear, we're just gonna quickly go through that. There we go. I think there are three areas, three tools that we should be focusing on as Manitobans and as Canadians to really try to move this agenda forward on behalf of our consumers, on behalf of our economy, on behalf of our resources, and on behalf of the industry that we call agriculture, the sector that, that, um, that uh, has a, a foothold, a pillar in all of our communities. One is that we have to recognize the role of government policy. Government policy is there to secure common goods and services that individuals cannot provide. Government policy is there to balance long-term societal goals with intermediate and short-term goals. And, pol and policy is there to anticipate change and enhance the resilience or adaptive capacity to allow that change. I think we're doing pretty good on those first two. But I think we have a long ways to go with respect to our capacity to anticipate change and to develop policy that allows adaptation and resiliency. And that is partly because agriculture in itself is complicated. Um, so it's, it's very, it, it's going to take time, it's going to take a number of experts to think through things, and so there's a hesitation. It's, it's easy to walk away from that and just pick the opinion that's politically expedient. The other thing is that we have cumbersome structures, cumbersome bureaucracy. Change is hard when you're trying to go through a number of systems, and those systems may not serve us well in the future. We need to take a look at those systems and processes to determine if our success in 2050 can be ensured with the kind of infrastructure and the kind of programming and bureaucracy we have today, the kinds of institutions. And, and I, I consider the university is a part of that. And so it's not a they them thing. I think it's an us thing. 
The second tool is around innovation or research and technology transfer. Um, Lewis Carroll, in, in the book Through the Looking Glass, um, has a little uh, saying that I think really reflects where we are with respect to innovation and research. Now here you are, or now here you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to go somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. The rest of the world has embraced adaptation. And if we are going to be competitive, if we are going to be um, uh, leading in any capacity, if we're going to be a stronger society, we have to recognize that we also have to invest and we also have to embrace and use what comes out of good innovation and good um, and, and, um, research. And we have to recognize that we need global connections, not just the researchers, but the industry and the public, global connections. We need to bring the new ideas to Manitoba as quickly as we can to identify what is good for us, what we want to use, and, and what doesn't apply. The third area is education. And for that, I have to go back to my notes because there's a quote that I just love. <laughs> In 1942, uh, a professor in social history was taking a look at the effect of literacy. Suddenly we were in a world in which people were, were predominantly literate. Um, and he, he wrote, education has produced a vast population able to read but unable to dis ex distinguish what is worth re reading. An easy prey to sensations and cheap appeals. That was 1942. That was the reaction to increased literacy, a game changer, a big change. Today with the web, we have exactly the same thing, but exploded a few times over. Too often in our schools, universities, and other organizations, we spend most of our effort in teaching people what to think and not in teaching people how to think. The education system has a role in the future success. It has a role not just in the faculty of agriculture, but in our secondary, primary schools and secondary schools to find a language that allows our young people to think more critically with the, with, with the information that they have available, to, to have the capacity to recognize long-term and short-term gain. And we have a role with respect to um, recognizing what is knowledge and what is opinion. Are we, when we follow trends, when we follow the gluten-free diet, or when we follow other trends, are we doing that on the basis of knowledge, or are we doing that on the basis of opinion? And what is the cost of society every time we do that? What is the cost of public health? What is the cost to our purse strings as individuals? These are things that we need to be thinking more about from the small, the small kids on up. Finally, I think we've done it by accident and we have to do it more purposefully. We need educated, visionary, and ethical leaders. And, and this is going to be an issue. Oh, we're going to roll it up here. Hang on. Technology. <laughs> it's for reasons like that that we have tried um, to, to engage in efforts like the Farm and Food Discovery Center at the university where uh, we allow people to come and learn about food and agriculture in an unbiased uh, environment. It's actually located just 15 minutes south of the university at one of our research stations, and it encompasses everything from uh, uh, the environment through to um, where our food goes globally. And I think I'll end by saying that um, I think we know some of the key tools, or I believe these are some of the key tools that we need to think about with respect to successful adaptation as we move towards Manitoba agriculture in 2050. I know as a dean of the faculty that um, uh, there is a role that our professionals, our students as they move into their careers have to play. It is going to include engagement and dialogue so that we develop those metrics. It's going to include 
finding the information that fills the toolbox, and then to encourage the use of those tools. The public also has a role to play. And, and I hope that the conversation I've had today um, gives you some ideas or, or, or um, um, some, some thinking over the next days. Thank you very much. Thanks. I appreciate that.